very happy that you are able to join us today. This is the second presentation I've given for Engineers Nova Scotia this month. So if you're tuning back in, welcome Black. Happy to be here with you. As an introduction for myself, uh, my name is Genevieve McGuinness. My company is Inspire Change, and I am on a mission to help technical leaders become confident and effective people leaders. Oftentimes people are recognized and promoted based on their technical abilities. And when they find themselves managing a team, they may struggle. And so I provide coaching and training and consulting as well as practical step-by-step -step tools to help fill in that gap. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how to be a cohesive team and looking at it from the perspective of how to be a cohesive team with remote team members. And back in, I think it was June, when we were starting to plan for this session, there was a little bit of question around, well, in October, will that still be relevant? Because, you know, we're in a pretty dynamic situation. Uh, we're not quite sure, you know, what the next few months are going to look like. And so back then, we didn't know what would it be like uh, in October? Would people still be working remotely? And so from the businesses that I've been uh, in touch with, I kind of see things across the board right now. We have some businesses who have been able to safely bring their teams back together into their offices. And so they're using that model. There are some businesses that have told me that nobody will come back into their office until there is uh, a vaccine. And then others that are working on some kind of hybrid, you know, maybe some people are back in the office, some are still working remotely, or maybe they're rotating some days in the office, some days uh, outside of the office. And so today we're going to talk about, um, you know, how to be a cohesive team, looking at it through that lens of also with remote members. And I'm going to share with you really three key areas of focus that if you spend time and energy here, then you will increase the, uh, the effectiveness and the cohesiveness of your team. You're also going to have some time to do some reflection as well of like what's working well in your team and where are some areas where you'd like to see improvement. So let's uh, dig in. So I guess first, just a little bit of like context or stage setting. I mean, the last eight months have been difficult, challenging for most individuals and businesses. We've all been affected by some way in this, uh, some way, we've all been affected by the pandemic in some way. And so, um, you know, that may be um, the way that we, uh, you know, the way that we go about our day-to-day -day activities. It could be uh, how we're working, how we are shopping and socializing. And as I mentioned earlier, planning is becoming really difficult. And so I'm seeing that some people are still having um, challenges with audio, but looks like from Beth, it sounds like it's good. Okay. So um, these, uh, you know, these, these changes that are happening, you know, in general, people don't respond very well to change and uncertainty. And so it creates a heightened level of stress and anxiety. And so in the workplace, some of the changes that we're seeing are things like new safety protocols and new PPE that's required. For some businesses, you know, business is exploding. Um, they've found new markets or whatever they, their product or service they're delivering is really in demand right now. So they've been, you know, really busy. And then for others, you know, they're on the opposite end of that spectrum where uh, maybe their products or services just aren't relevant at this time, or they're not able to bring those to market, or they're having other challenges because of, you know, supply chains and those sorts of things. So we have, new focuses and new expectations. And those can be for business, but they can also be personal as well. And a lot of people are taking some time to reflect on like, what's really important to me and what are my values? And, um, you know, that's changing the way that people are approaching their work. We've adopted new technologies to allow us to work more effectively when we're not all in the same office together. And so those are things that people have to learn and adapt to and you know some embrace them and love them and others really resist that change and then we've got these new work environments we have uh, remote work being a big part of that and there's lots of benefits to working from home or working remotely it's something that employees have been asking for for a while and so some of those benefits is that you know it gives us more flexibility and if done properly it helps to promote that work-life integration uh, it can help us attract new talent and it can increase productivity. 
but there's definitely a downside of work from home as well. It certainly doesn't work for everybody. Um, there can be increased in loneliness. Uh, we don't get as, as much um, like visibility or you know that hands-on contact with people that we had before. Uh, productivity may have gone down. We may not have um, um, you know good um, like a good insight or oversight onto what's happening um, with our employees at home. And so that those can be some of the challenges that um, that come up as well. So that's really where we're at. And because of uh, all of these changes, um, it makes it critically important that we are focusing on some of the fundamentals of how to be a good team. And so this diagram here around how to build a high performing team is based off of Patrick Lissoni's book, um, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And when I am delivering training or working with teams, I frequently ask people to think about a time when they were a part of a high performing team. And so that could be in the workplace, it could be in sports, it could be in their community. And so I asked them to think about like, what were those characteristics? What does it feel like to be a part of a high performing team? What were some of the keys to your success? And their answers can generally always fit into one of these five buckets. And so it's designed as a triangle on purpose because uh, the bottom, <laughs> the foundation is where the most effort, time and energy needs to be spent. And so it starts with building trust. And so when teams have a high level of trust, there's mutual uh, respect and collaboration. There's this feeling like, you know, uh, like you're all in it together, like people have your back. Uh, you're able to give and receive feedback because people are open to that. It's a learning environment, so it's okay to make mistakes. And because you have this high level of trust, information froze really freely and you also have a lot of fun. <laughs> and then once we've got that foundation of trust, then we're looking to create an environment where we have healthy conflict. And so healthy conflict encourages differences of opinion. It encourages people to share their ideas. We make sure that all voices get heard, not just the people with the strongest personalities or the people with the most senior title. So we're hearing from all voices, even when opinions are uh, different or um, polarizing in some way. When we have that conflict, healthy conflict, we also have like really interesting meetings <laughs> because you never really know what's going to happen. And uh, when we and when we have healthy conflict, it also means that we're dealing with the unhealthy conflict that exists in our organization. Uh, High performing teams have then a high level of commitment. And so you can't commit to what you don't know. And so in this, in this commitment bracket, we're really looking at what are the expectations? What are the goals? What's the vision? Where are we going? And then getting everybody behind that goal and aligned so that we're moving towards common objectives. When we have that, again, we get that sense that we're all in this together and it's easier to make decisions because we know what our guidelines are, right? Our guideposts are really clear in our decision making. And then going further up that um, triangle, we've got accountability. And so that means that people, you know, take ownership for their areas of responsibility. Uh, they, um, you know, they're, they're willing to disclose what they're working on and what each other are working on. We have clear roles and responsibilities and it's really easy to identify where the problems are and then to resolve them. And then the smallest part of the triangle is the results. And the results are collective results. We all win or we all lose. And so at, at a high performing team, we see much less individualistic behavior and a lot more, uh, you know, less less individualistic material, sorry, individualistic uh, behaviors and less silos and more uh, working towards the collective good. And so what often happens is that we jump right to the top, right? We want results and we try to we spend a lot of time trying to force those results. But if we went back to the bottom of the triangle and spend our time focusing on like, do we have trust? And then we build from there. So in the time that we have today, we're going to focus on trust, healthy conflict, and commitment, setting expectations. 
So when it comes to trust, trust is really, um, it's really simple and tricky at the same time. You know, um, the principles are not hard to follow to build trust, but once trust has been damaged or broken, it's really hard to get it back. And people have such strong beliefs around uh, trust. So you've probably heard things like, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Or some people will make really strong statements like, you know, I give trust freely to everyone. And other people will say things like, trust is something you have to earn. And so these ideas of trust are deeply ingrained. And once trust has been damaged or broken, it is difficult to get it back. There are no, um, there's, there's no magic wand. There's no way to force people to trust each other. It is a process and it takes time and it takes effort. And so these behaviors uh, are some of the things that you can do to help ensure that you protect the trust within your team. And so the first thing is to keep your word. I frequently hear from people that they don't trust their leader or their coworkers because they don't do what they say they're going to do. And that doesn't really require any more explanation than that because you know that to be true yourself, right? You don't trust people who don't say what they're, who don't do what they say they're going to do. Actions speak louder than words always. So we want to make sure that we don't create this culture where people frequently will say things like, well, I'll believe it when I see it. The next behavior is to be honest and to act with integrity. And so honesty and integrity are key characteristics that most people want from their leaders and their coworkers. In fact, honesty and integrity will often trump performance. And what I mean by that is that most people would rather work with somebody who they trust, who's honest and acts with integrity, than someone who is exceptionally um, uh, skilled in a particular area. So they'd rather work with somebody with high trust and maybe you know medium performance than somebody with uh, really high performance and low trust. And oftentimes, and I find that interesting too, because oftentimes when there are sort of gaps in our performance or our abilities, oftentimes we might try to hide those or not be forthcoming with them. And that's another way to kind of erode that, you know, integrity and trust within the relationship. Honesty is definitely easier said than done. And oftentimes, you know, we might be dealing with situations where the news is really hard to deliver. And so that makes it difficult to be honest or um, it's complex and we just don't have all the answers. So we're not sure how to be honest. Or there may be, you know, like confidentiality or other issues that are involved that we just aren't able to freely disclose everything. And so, yes, you do have to navigate all of those things within your workplace. But in my um, my experience, my opinion, I would always say that, you know, you want to try to be as honest as possible, even when it's uncomfortable. And then we also have like honesty traps. And so these are things that um, I often witness happening in difficult conversations. And so the first honesty trap is that um, we're willing to have the conversation and we say most of what needs to be said, but we don't take it all the way. We hold back on those pieces that we find the hardest to deliver. And so maybe you're having a performance conversation with somebody and you talk about the issue, but you but you don't drive it home and you don't let them know that, hey, this, if it doesn't improve, um, could result in further discipline up to including dismissal. So you don't let them know necessarily how big of an impact this problem is. And then the second honesty trap that I find is that people are just too wishy-washy in their delivery. And so they kind of go all around the topic and they speak to one side and then they speak to the other side and they leave the person being really kind of confused of like, what is the message here and what are you telling me? And you know you're doing this when people ask you questions, when they say to you, are you telling me this? Are you saying this? And so if you find that people are often asking you those questions, it's probably because you're not being clear enough in your communication. And then the third uh, honesty trap that I find is that people can be clear, but they're not direct. And what I mean by that is that they are uh, talking about whatever the issue is, but they're not putting 
the hard things to say on the table. And so, for example, a thought would be maybe you're meeting with somebody to let them know, like an internal candidate, that they didn't receive a promotion or they weren't selected to work on a special project. And rather than coming out and saying you weren't selected, you talk about the skills that required that were required or the education that was required, and you're building a profile of somebody who is not them. And so they walk away knowing like, okay, I didn't get the job, but you'll hear the feedback when they're talking to others of like, oh, they didn't have the guts to say it. You know, they didn't just come out and say that I didn't get the job. So those are um, some honest traps to be, uh, uh, to be aware of. And then the next thing on our list is about sharing information openly. And so of course you have to respect confidentiality, but outside of that, we wanna make sure that we do have these good channels to, to, to make sure that everybody's up to date and everybody has the information that they need. And so for some businesses, this is really looking at how are we sharing information? And a lot of communication happens in workplaces informally. So you happen to be walking by somebody's desk or you run into them in the lunchroom or, you know, it's the last, you know, it's 15 minutes after the meeting ended. That's where you're like sharing all this important information that you need to. And so if you're not gathering in those same ways anymore, then how are you sharing information and are people getting, you know, the right information that they need at the right time? So we want to make sure that we have this like feedback loop that's happening as well, that we're checking in with our teams to find out. Do you have the information that you need at the right time? Is it too much, which it rarely is? Is it too little? And is it coming in, in the right way? Uh, then we want to uh, demonstrate confidence in others. And so really the energy around how you act and behave when your team members believe in you is very, very different than how you act and behave when you feel like you have to prove yourself. And so this is a very simple thing that we can do just by speaking about others and confidence, showing that we have confidence in their abilities to help increase that trust level. Uh, we wanna have um, transparency within our uh, team as well. And by transparency here, I'm talking about who's doing what when. And so, um, Teams don't operate very well when they feel like the workload is um, not fair, not evenly distributed, if they are unaware of what their other team members' deliverables are. And so we wanna make sure that that's all open. And so like who's doing what and um, that they're held accountable for those things as well. And so accountability is also about, you know, um, speaking up when things don't go well. And it's really interesting in teams where there's high levels of trust, when somebody makes a mistake and they raise their hand and they say, oh, I, you know, I messed up here, I missed something. In teams with high trust, it's not uncommon to see others around the table then take part of that blame as well. Oh, well, I could have presented that information differently, or I could have stepped in over here, or I could have helped you in this way. And so they take a piece of that blame which is the opposite of what happens in a team with low trust. In a team with low trust, when a mistake's made, people try to bury it or hide it or uh, place blame on other people or on the circumstances, right? Nobody wants to own that, um, that problem or that issue. So accountability helps to um, uh, create this trust. And then also with accountability, I would say giving credit to, uh, to others. So making sure that they are, um, you know, recognized and appreciated for the work that they do. So giving credit to them for their ideas, for their accomplishments. And again, in a high performing team, when you give credit to other people, what often happens is they will try to share that credit with others. Whereas in a low trust environment, people own <laughs> those wins because it's, um, you know, it's part of their uh, self-protection amongst the team. And then of course we have to address gossip and disrespectful behavior. And so um, I instruct um, a fair amount of respect in the workplace training. And oftentimes people will come up to me afterwards and tell me really horrible stories of things that have happened to them in the workplace. And oftentimes there are witnesses. It happens around other people and those people don't speak up. And so when we don't speak up, when something happens that's disrespectful or that's gossip, then we are sending a very strong message that we condone it. Even if internally we think it's wrong and we don't like it, if we don't say anything, then we are condoning the behavior and we're letting people know that it's okay.
Oops. So I just lost my slide deck. I don't know if you guys can still see it or Beth, if you can put that up there. Okay, so we'll just wait for a second for that to, uh, to come back up. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, we need to address those disrespectful behaviors. And then the last piece is about, about uh, increasing trust is to focus on interpersonal relationships. And so here I'm talking about, you know, um, we need to still have space for those that, that chit chat, those conversations that connect us together. And they might be things about, you know, what we're having for lunch or what we watched on TV last night or the plans that we have for the weekend. And so when we're remote, sometimes we have less opportunity to have those conversations. So make sure that, um, you know, we still build those into our conversations and the meetings that we're having. Um, a good check-in is just asking people, you know, how they're feeling. And so we make sure that, you know, we're, we're doing those uh, touch points and still allowing people to form those strong bonds and relationships. All right, so those are some behaviors to uh, increase trust. And then once we, so this is, uh, you know, again, opportunity for reflection to think about like of those things that uh, we just went through, what are things that you think you or your team does really well? What are some things that maybe the team is doing that they should stop doing? And then what are some things that, um, you know, maybe you that aren't currently being implemented, but you think that you could. So those are some things to think about around your team, around trust, because really it starts here. And when we try to go to the next level until we have this really solid base level of trust, um, we usually don't get very far. So the next step is around having healthy conflict. When we have healthy conflict, we view conflict differently. Um, and we, when we view conflict as like a positive thing, as a good thing, as something that alerts us that there's a problem and then that motivates us to take some action, which is usually to start asking some questions uh, to get a better understanding of uh, where that person's coming from. And healthy conflict um, looks like respectful disagreement. It's about being able to have differences of opinions, differences of ways of approaching things and being able to talk about those in a way that doesn't get personal. And so we can have, you know, completely different views on how to handle a situation. We can, we can hash those out, but at the end of the day, you're still okay, I'm still okay, and we're still willing to go for lunch together. I had a coworker that I worked with a while ago who um, used to make a game out of this because him and I were very different in our approaches and our uh, beliefs. And so when we would come together to solve problems, he would say, let's play the game. And our game was point counterpoint. And so, you know, one of us would start, we would have our, our ideas, our arguments, and then the other person would go. And because we made it a game and because we were interested in hearing each other's point of view, there wasn't any defensiveness. It wasn't about winning. It wasn't about, you know, it being my way or his way. It was really about hearing each other out. And sometimes at the end of those discussions, we would come up with a plan. Other times we'd say, you know, I got to sleep on it and, you know, we'll come back afterwards. So you want to have this respectful disagreement that does not get personal and doesn't damage the relationship. Uh, when we have healthy conflict, we get better solutions because, uh, you know, we hear from everybody, we, um, you know, take things, take the conversation deeper, and then we have these strengthened relationships. I worked with another manager who often used to say, you know, you're not in a relationship with somebody until you have your first fight. You know, you have to be able to have a disagreement and get through the other side of it and still care about each other. And that's how you strengthen your relationship. But oftentimes when we think about conflict, we do think about it as a fight, right? We think about it as a battle, as a, as a you know, something that, that there is this winner or loser. But in reality, conflict happens anytime one person's needs are not being met by another. And so anytime one person's needs are not being met by another, we're gonna have some form of conflict. And the other thing about conflict is that when it, when it happens, it activates our fight or flight response. And so this is that primitive response. It happens in the back of our brain in the amygdala, and it's automatically triggered anytime that we feel threatened. 
And so, you know, at some point in our evolution, that was like really beneficial for us to have. And the threats that we were that we were usually under would have been physical threats, you know, life or death situations. But for most of us on this call, we're not in the state of constant physical threat. But we still view these threats of like our needs not being met. Those are the threats that are tripping this fight or flight. And when it happens, it is a physical response. Um, we get this flood of uh, cortisol and, um, and adrenaline goes through our bodies. Our pupils dilate. Uh, blood goes to our extremities so we can either like punch really hard or run really fast. And uh, our heart beats faster. Our breathing gets more shallow. And so we feel that in our bodies. And I think it's important for people to know that because sometimes people kind of like maybe they freeze or they get really um, uh, aggressive when it comes to conflict and just know that like what's happening is a, it's a natural response. It's happening when it first happens, it's sort of outside of your control. It's not something you think about. And so then once you're aware of that response, you can be uh, more in tune to it when it's happening. And just by taking, being aware of it and then taking a few deep breaths can help your body get back into its like natural state. All right, so going on with uh, conflict, uh, these are some sources of conflict that happen in the workplace. And so oftentimes, you know, it's coming from conflicting goals. And so this is when one person or one's team goals don't line up with another. As a very simplistic example, you know, you might have uh, someone who's responsible or a team that's responsible to get products out the door on time. You have another uh, person or team who's responsible to make sure that they meet quality standards. And then you have another group or team who's responsible to make sure that uh, it's profitable and that they're done, you know, at the lowest cost possible. And sometimes those, you know, competing goals will conflict with each other and they will cause some tension and some conflict. Then the other uh, thing that we'll see is different perspectives. And so we all have different like beliefs and values and upbringings and culture and language. And so we all see the world through our own lens and having these different uh, perspectives and behavioral styles can have a big impact on how we interact with each other. So I'm also a big fan of uh, psychometric testing, those behavioral assessments, because it gives an opportunity for people to learn more about themselves, how they show up in situations, but also gives a language to sort of talk about how others show up as well that may be different from your own. Uh, another source of conflict would be task interdependence. And so very few of us have jobs that are 100% within our control and that don't rely on other people for us to be successful. And oftentimes one person's job doesn't have a lot of awareness about another person's job or reality, you know, what it takes for them to do what they do or why they do the things the way that they do. And so that in, in interdependence can cause some conflict. Uh, lack of resources that often creates scarcity and when there is scarcity when there's not enough to go around a very common reaction is that people will hoard their resources and so they don't share and that might be knowledge that they're not sharing it could be people it could be budget uh, time all of those things uh, if there's a lack of rules or a lack of understanding of the rules, then people are allowed to behave in, uh, however they want. They make things up as they go and there's no consequences to that. So we want to have really clear guidelines on what the expectations are of how we should behave in the workplace. And then, of course, underlying all of these things is poor communication. So those are some sources of conflict. You may recognize some of those within your workplace. And sometimes I think it's just helpful to know this so that you can pinpoint that's, you know, that's where that comes from, right? That's where that unhealthy conflict is coming from, which is what we're gonna talk about next. So when we have unhealthy conflict in our workplace, it creates a great amount of emotional and physical stress. And so we can't really understate that, you know, when you're kind of locked in a conflict with somebody, you know this, you take it home with you, uh, it may keep you up at night, um, it may, you know, like take away some of the enjoyment of some of the other things that you like to do. And for the workplace, it often translates into things like higher sick days, more absenteeism, uh, and leaves that people may take, as well as, you know, um, or what we sometimes call... Um, 
like a lack of presenteeism, right? People are there, but they're not actually really contributing because they're so caught up in whatever this conflict is. So for the people who are involved in the conflict, it often has um, a great personal toll. Then um, we have delays in decision making and poor decision making. And, you know, when two people are in conflict, especially if they're leaders within the organization, there's usually a lot of dysfunction around making decisions because the real issues aren't being brought to the table. People aren't having the conversations that they need to have. And so we get to this next point of like fake agreement so that maybe you're having a meeting. Nobody says that they don't agree with the plan in the meeting, but then after the meeting, there's all these side conversations that are going on and people are working their own agendas in the background. And so those sorts of things will, you know, this unhealthy conflict will damage relationships. Um, people tend to hold on to things for a really long time. Uh, when I'm mediating conflict and I'm talking to people about, um, you know, they're telling me stories about their coworker or maybe they'll make some really strong statements. And I'll ask them to like, can you give me an example of that? And oftentimes the examples that people will give will be two years old or six months old. And I'll say, and anything else, anything more recent? And they'll say, nope, <laughs> you know? And so uh, once a relationship is damaged, um, you know, we, we hold on to those things for a long time and it influences all the other interactions that we have with that person. Unhealthy conflict is really unproductive and it's time consuming and not just for the people that are in the conflict, but it's like a, you know, conflict is like a pebble in a pond that spreads out amongst the organization because other people see it as, as it escalates. Other people get drawn into the conflict for the person who's trying to, you know, if it's amongst your team, the leader who's trying to manage that can take an excessive amount of their time to do it. Um, depending on the conflict, maybe it's interesting to other people so that I spend time talking about that conflict. And so all of those things take away from, um, you know, reaching the goals of the organization. And unresolved conflict uh, tends to escalate. And oftentimes people will just hope that, that conflict will go away on its own. That very rarely happens. And um, the longer a conflict goes on, the more difficult it is to resolve. And as conflict is going through those different stages, uh, you know, as it's escalating, um, kind of in the middle stage is something that we would call avoidance. And it's exactly what it sounds. You avoid the person you have the conflict with. This is a very natural human behavior. We are, um, you know, wired to, um, you know, uh, to move towards pleasure and to avoid pain. And so why would you spend time with somebody who pushes your buttons and annoys you and you don't enjoy being around. And so in uh, what would be our regular workplace habits, sometimes we can see that avoidance happening because we notice the change in behaviors. People used to have lunch together and, or, you know, lunch in the lunchroom and now they don't go there anymore. They're avoiding these certain places within the workplace. And so, but in a remote workplace, it can become even more underground and we don't see it as much but it shows up because it shows up in ways that people aren't having the conversations that they need to have. They're not passing on the information that they need to pass on. And, um, and that can create a lot of, a lot of challenges within your workplace. So that would be an area that, you know, I would consider, I would suggest looking into is like what conflicts existed maybe before people moved to remote work and, uh, and then what happened? Did they really go away or did they just go underground? And as I mentioned, the longer we take to address those conflicts, the more difficult it's going to be uh, to resolve them. All right, so the last thing that we're going to spend time on today is uh, workplace expectations. And so workplace expectations are required to get that third piece in our triangle, the commitment. We can't commit to something that we don't know. And um, when it comes to setting expectations, you know, it's a really, it's a pretty wide gamut because we're looking at, you know, accountabilities. So the outcomes that we're looking for someone to achieve, but we're also looking at um, what the acceptable behaviors are as well. So it's both of those things. It's what we're doing, but it's also the behaviors that we're displaying, like the how we're doing them as well. And they cover everything from, you know, 
tone of email to um, you know the big things like the company um, vision and strategic plan. So workplace expectations cover all of that gamut. And I often um, you know have had conversations with leaders who are frustrated about something that's happening on their team or from their employee. And when we kind of dig into it, it turns out that, you know, it's because they haven't set people up for success. They haven't described what success is. They haven't told them what their expectation is. And oftentimes when we get to that point, um, you know, the response will be like, well, it's kind of like it's common sense or it's obvious or don't they know that? And my response to that is like, well, how has it been working out for you so far? <laughs> you know, and so even these things that we think that people should know and understand that's you know they can't get inside our heads so we have to be able to make those things really descriptive for people and employees you know want to know what's expected of them at work that's uh, also a foundation for employee engagement if people don't know what is, is expected then um you know they're kind of left in the dark of like am i am i doing a good job is the work that i'm doing is it is it adding value? Is it the right thing? And people will always fill in the gaps when we haven't, um, you know, when we haven't made it explicit. So many businesses and leaders don't spend enough time on this. They don't spend enough time um, figuring out and communicating expectations, and then they suffer because of it. It's that you know um, that you can't hit the bullseye if you don't know where the target is. So. Uh, we need to have clear expectations because that moves, gets everybody moving in the same direction. And a team that doesn't have goals, that doesn't have a clear understanding of where they're going and aren't working towards that together, are not a team. That's like a foundation of being a team. You have to have a common goal. And when it comes to um, uh, you know creating uh, expectations, your balance scorecards, your SMART goals, your KPIs, your OKRs and KIPs, whatever you're using to sort of to measure, that's the easy part. It really is. Sitting down and figuring those out, that's the easy part. The hard part is aligning those things with everybody's day-to-day -day activities. And so that to me is where the real work comes in. Uh, because if these are things that we, you know, we it, they're not a one and done. They're not uh, goals. They're not things that we set or communicate once and then it's done. It has to become a part of the, you know, really the life of the organization, what guides people every day. And um, having these expectations really cleared out kind of helps people connect their work to meaning and purpose. And many people want this. You know, some people, it'll be enough to just have the goal uh, and they're like, I don't know, that, that will motivate them to achieve. But for a lot of people, they want to know the why. They really want to know like, what's the point of this? Why does it matter? What's the purpose? And so by having these expectations uh, clearly outlined, then we can start connecting it to that, that individual's uh, daily work and the meaning and purpose of how that fits into the overall vision. And of course, they have to be, um, they have to be flexible and they evolve over time. And so I think the last eight months has been a really <laughs> good example of that, that, you know, we can't predict the future. Um, and so we have to be able to, you know, adapt as we go along. And, um, you know, if you hadn't had these conversations, it's, it's a good time to go back and look at, you know, what has changed since the pandemic. Uh, the expectations that we set before, are they still that? Are we communicating what our expectations are right now? And are they, you know, changing on a regular basis? Then we need to communicate those on a regular basis. So these are some, um, uh, I guess, the steps to setting expectations. And so the first one is that you need to get really clear on um, what your expectations are. And if you are not able to articulate it, then other people will not be able to meet it. And so I know it when I see it does not cut it here. You have to be much more explicit than that. And if you can't articulate it, then, um, then you can't expect other people to meet it. So you've got to do the work there first. And then the next step is like I talked about providing that context, why this matters, how it fits into the bigger picture. 
Uh, when it comes to um, communicating, it's something that often has to be done on a regular basis so that we're keeping it like front and center. And so I definitely recommend that you put these in writing. Um, you may uh, want to make it visual as well. If it is something that people can track sort of on a daily or weekly or monthly basis, then make sure you're putting those charts up there so that people can see it. And then it becomes part of your everyday conversations, your uh, coaching calls and your meetings that you're having. You're always pulling those expectations back in so that people are uh, aware and that they stay front and center and that they direct our energy. Uh, things that we um, focus on and that we measure, those are the things that we pay attention to, right? And so we want to make sure that we are putting that focus there. Uh, it's a good idea as well in our communication to make sure that we're getting input. Do people buy into this? Uh, are they, do they feel it's achievable and realistic? Do they think these are the important things that we should be working on? And what barriers do they have to achievement? Really what you're looking for here is like, are they all in, you know? And if they're not all in, then why and what do they need in order to get there? And then, uh, of course, we want to uh, like celebrate our uh, celebrate our wins, recognize the achievements that we are making. Oftentimes, you know, when it comes to achieving goals and getting the results that we're looking for, it's usually those small little steps that happen along the way that you know create the the, the big win in the end. And so, uh, we don't necessarily just want to celebrate that big win. We want to celebrate those uh, little things that come along the way. So that is, and so here in terms of like when you're, when you are uh, thinking about expectations, some of the reflections questions that I would say is, you know, where are your pain points? Where are you frustrated with either an individual's performance or uh, like a team or a company performance? And so that's a good sign that you maybe, that you haven't set a clear expectation. So I would start there first. And then, um, you know, where aren't, where aren't you achieving the results that you want to? And so have you been clear around your expectations and the goals there? Have things changed as a result of the pandemic? So that's another uh, area we want to be looking into. And have you communicated those changes? And are people still aligned? Are they, they still believe um, that you're on the right track and that these, uh, you know, this, these are the things that we should be working on? So that's the information that I have to share with you today. Um, before we close off, I will open it up just to see if there are any questions. And if you have questions, you can put those into the chat. And so while we are uh, waiting for that, so any questions, you can put those into the chat while we're waiting. Um, you know, I just have my contact information up here. I would love for you to connect with me. You can also find me on LinkedIn. And as a, um, you know, to let you know as well that on December 11th, I'll be doing a half day workshop on this topic. We're going to be digging much deeper into uh, how to build trust, resolve conflict, and set expectations, as well as giving sort of some tools on how you can do that. And so if that is something that you are interested in, then certainly reach out to me and I can send you some more details on that. So I can see that multiple people are typing. So we will just sort of sit tight for a minute and um, see, uh, see what comes up in case there are any questions. Yeah, so, um, so Jillian has asked, any suggestions for team building exercises for remote teams? And so um, I guess a couple, I mean, I think that um, a lot of the things that you maybe would have done um, before in your office, you can still just modify those and do those on your Zoom calls. And so oftentimes people like to start with just like quick icebreakers, you know, so things like, um, uh, I mean, I guess it depends on, and I guess it depends on the culture of your, of your workplace of what people are interested in, but I have seen people do things like, you know, they still might do like a crazy hat or a dress up, uh, those sorts of things. You might play some games like, um, you know, two truths and a lie, those kinds of things, those check-ins of like, how's everybody feeling? And then if you want to do something that is more kind of like in depth and, um, 
uh, then I would recommend things like I mentioned earlier about that psychometric testing. So doing some behavioral assessments and then um, doing a workshop around that so that people understand you know, their own behavioral styles better and then others as well. And that can be, uh, that can be a lot of fun. And uh, to me, it's a really, it's a, it's a much more deeper <laughs> exercise that can help to promote team building. Okay, and so uh, also a question here about managing expectations from multiple people more than your own manager. And so, yeah, so this also, um, I empathize with you because it can be a really difficult situation to be in when you're trying to uh, please a lot of different people. And so um, here I would suggest that you, you know, be really, really realistic about what you can do and uh, make sure that others, your manager or whoever uh, else is relevant, is helping you set those priorities. So you need to be really clear on what you can do and what you can't do. And so if there's three projects on the go and they're to three, you're responding to three different people about that and they're all saying they're really important, then either you have to be your own advocate to say, you know, I can do this, but then this is going to suffer. So you're helping them kind of, um, you know, uh, determine what their priorities are, or you're working that through your manager to say, you know, these are all the different things that I have on the go, and it's not possible to meet all of these expectations at the same time, and to let them help you kind of sort through with what they are. Okay. Um, yeah, so a question around um, uh, trips to give clear expectations and so, um, and too general or too detailed. So, you know, I would say with expectations, um, you can't be too detailed in the sense that, you know, you could be too micromanaging, but essentially you want to be as clear as possible. And so it depends on what type of expectation you are setting of how clear you need to be. It also depends on the person that you are working with. And sometimes it's a bit of trial and error. And just as like, because the example comes to my head first, like, let's just say you tell your kid to clean their room, right? <laughs> and then you go back in and they think they've cleaned their room, but there's still a bunch of stuff under the bed. And maybe there's still dishes there and they haven't made the bed. And so now you've got to be more explicit in what clean your room means, right? So sometimes with expectations, you are also looking at like, the, uh, the person that you are setting the expectation for and how um, for how detailed you need to be. But essentially, anybody should be able to read that expectation and understand what it means. So SMART goals are a good way to a good judge. So, you know, making sure that it's specific and measurable and uh, attainable and uh, achievable and time bound. All right, so those are the questions um, that I see. Again, I invite you to uh, reach out to me for that uh, half day workshop as well, because uh, we're going to get it's on December 11th. We're going to get much more detailed into all of these things. And then where, you know, in this context, it's like reading a question and I can kind of normally I like to ask a few more questions to really understand um, uh, you know, where you're coming from in that to give sort of like valuable advice around that issue. And so we'll be digging into that stuff a lot more in that session. And then also giving some, you know, practical uh, handouts as well, like tools to use for setting expectations, for having difficult conversations and uh, increasing trust. All right. So thank you all for your time today. I really appreciate that. And uh, I hope you have a great Thursday afternoon.